Bird Watching in a Backyard, Spring 2020, by Peter G. Sanger. Allow me to begin by sharing that our backyard is a bit special, both in size and habitat. Our actual yard, the Mode Green Desert, is very small, smaller than most suburban yards, and is only around the immediate house. We mow more trails than yard. I was fortunate to have my parents gift me with three acres to build a house in a former cattle pasture back in the early 1990s. This property is located in southeastern Pennsylvania at 1,100 feet above sea level on the southernmost ridge of the Appalachian Mountains. It has a little wetland meadow bordered by mature forest with the house tucked into a dry corner at the edge. Over the years, the edges have filled in with secondary forest and brush, creating perfect edge habitat to support a good variety of bird species. When my parents passed and I had to settle the estate, I saved some of the surrounding property of forest and two old farm fields totaling another 41 acres. Almost all of these 45 acres are now under a federal conservation easement protected as natural lands forever. The government was interested in having the easement because the forest is in the headwaters of an exceptional value, or EV, stream, had very few non-native invasive plants and some unique wildlife. So our backyard really is a wonderful place. Because of COVID-19, on the 13th of March, Muhlenberg College, where I work, suspended all in-person classes and ordered us to work from home. I am fortunate to have plenty of work that I could do from home so I could keep being productive, but it also gave me the opportunity to observe the change of seasons and activity in our yard like never before. The house, designed for a bird watcher, has lots of windows to view the outdoors. My desk in our home office sits in front of a picture window overlooking our small fish pond and our backyard, offering distractions from my work at hand. My days were spent me answering the many emails received and compiling spreadsheets of bird window collisions from around the world. I began most days at 5 a.m., well before first light, enjoying a cup of coffee, watching flying squirrels visiting the bird feeders, waiting for first light and the dawn song to start. I decided to use eBird to track the species that visited our yard as the weeks passed and seasons changed. In the beginning, we had the usual species of year-round residents and winter visitors, cardinals, song sparrows, dark-eyed junco, white-throated sparrow, a handful of American tree sparrows, various woodpeckers, nuthatches, etc. As the days passed, the juncos departed and, as usual, never said goodbye. The white throat stuck around for a bit longer than usual, and other northern species that had wintered to our south moved through on their travels to breeding grounds to our north. Our spring was cold and long. We had a late, hard frost on the 16th of May, but after that it slowly warmed up. Migrants began to dribble in, and soon the warblers, tanagers, orioles, and beautiful indigo buntings were flitting through the meadow, the trees, and visiting our feeders. My yard list for the year was growing steadily. Not a spectacular spring season, and a bit disappointing, since I had high expectations because of being home every day, hoping for days of old when fallouts of warblers were so phenomenal. I was reminded of the recent report that North America had lost 3 billion birds in the past 50 years. The estimate used to be a population of 10 billion birds in the spring, and by the end of the breeding season, that number grew to 20 billion birds. My understanding of this is we now have a population of 7 billion birds in the spring and 14 billion birds in the fall. It appears there is not the recovery capacity as in the past. This aside, I spent many enjoyable hours watching the birds pass through our yard with a final count of 14 species of warblers seen or heard and a few unexpected surprises. Being situated where we are on a ridge, passing migrants, even if not using the habitat directly, were observable as they passed by. 
species like double-crested cormorant, osprey, and bald eagles passed overhead on their travels elsewhere. One morning, while I enjoyed a cup of coffee listening to the morning coming alive, I heard a bird singing a song that sounded familiar, but I could not place it to a species. It was in a large area of shrub dogwoods behind my wife's garden, and try as I might, I could not see the bird, even though it sounded to be within ten feet of me. The bird fell silent, and I returned to my seat on the porch. Shortly thereafter, the bird could be heard singing in the brush, behind our bird feeders, and again I walked over to try to see the bird, but to no avail. This went on for two or three mornings until finally, while standing at the edge of the dogwood patch, there was the bird, two feet off the ground, only five or six short feet from me. A northern water thrush. This was only the second time I had seen this species anywhere on our property, and to have it in our yard was quite the unexpected treat. Oddly, the bird stayed for ten days, singing first from behind my wife's garden, then moving to the bushes behind our bird feeders. I became hopeful that it would stay, but we are a bit south of their known breeding locations, and after ten days, it moved on. Another water thrush, a Louisiana water thrush, was found along a stream in our lower woods, and this one, I believe, is a nesting species on our property. Our annual anniversary plans were canceled due to COVID-19, so my wife and I camped along the stream and enjoyed its song in the evening, and again at first light, accompanied by a calling screech owl. Another highlight of our spring was, for the first time, after decades of trying to lure Orioles to grape jelly and half an orange, I finally succeeded. I believe due to the cold spring, the birds needed food, so we enjoyed watching them eat jars of raspberry and grape jam, along with bunches of oranges. At least one pair set up residence, and we enjoy their beautiful song and colors each day. Here in the first days of summer, my year-to-date yard list stands at 92 species, so I have nothing to complain about. Most were seen or heard from our back porch. Yes, we have acres, but due to some health issues, most of my bird watching is from our porch or from one of our many windows looking out at our yard and meadow. Speaking of windows, I had mentioned working on spreadsheets of bird window collisions. This is part of my day job, tracking the number of birds documented to collide with windows here and worldwide. Sad to note that second only to habitat destruction and perhaps cats, Windows are the leading human cause of avian mortality worldwide. It is estimated that in the U.S. alone, an average of one million birds collide with glass each and every day. Most occur at homes like yours and mine, where we create havens to attract birds, unfortunately in close proximity to windows. If you are interested to learn more about this and how to prevent the problem at your home, please go to visit the Muhlenberg College website. This has been a truly wonderful spring, with many sightings of birds only a few yards from our home. The key is habitat, and that means native plants that support the insects our birds eat and offer them additional food and cover. I have a friend who lives in a local city. She measures her backyard in square feet and her neighbors offer nothing for wildlife. She has replaced the non-native plants in her yard with native plantings and added a small pond with a fountain. She draws in more migrants to her yard than I see in ours because she offers the habitat birds need while migrating, while otherwise none is found. Of course, I am sure the birds she sees in her yard are also found on our acres, but because she offers native habitat in a concrete and non-native desert, she draws them in. While I have a large backyard, even a small urban backyard, and anything in between can bring you the birds we all enjoy. Be sure to check out Native Plants at National Audubon Society's website 
for a wonderful resource to find the plants to help you transform any yard, no matter how large or small, into an oasis for our native birds. Thinking about my backyard birding over the years, I have some additional thoughts and information. I moved into this house in April of 1992 and started my yard list, which now stands at 167 species. Growing up on this property since 1959, there are species that I had seen previously that are not on this list, such as a North Bobwhite, now extirpated. Rough Grouse is another that used to inhabit our woods, but has not been seen here in a few decades. The most unusual on the list is Ruddy Turnstone, seen during a spring migration when a flock of 10 to 15 flew over a treetop level so low I heard their wing noise as they approached before actually seeing them. Other unexpected birds include flyover common loons and mergansers, an American bittern walking our meadow trails and yard edges, a northern shrike hunting our feeders, and Dick Sissel that spent part of the winter here. After keeping my yard list for 28 years, I was thinking it is going to be difficult to add any more species, but recently a friend of mine introduced me to Night Flight Recording, or NFC. Simply put, it is placing a sound recording device outdoors at night and recording the sounds of migrating birds overhead. You can get into this game for less than $100 or spend considerably more if you get serious about it, but it sounds like fun and I'm going to try it. There is plenty of information on the web if you do a search for it. Wishing you all well in these strange times of COVID-19 and hope that you may find peace and solace within the joys of nature that can be as close as our backyards.